All right, uh, hello. Uh, we're the Caterpillar guys, and uh, I came last year to this, and I was kind of excited about it. And uh, when I saw the presentations, I thought uh, nobody answered the questions that I wanted answered all the way. And so I thought I'm going to get down into the real weeds and tell you exactly what we do at Caterpillar for telematics. Um, you can go ahead and hit the button. One more. Yeah, but you guys got to get up there. So uh, my name's Mark, and uh, I've worked at Caterpillar for 23 years, and uh, I've written, I guess, two of the generations of telematics. Uh, it's uh, the coolest job on earth. Uh, all of our tractors uh, talk to us every day, and uh, Justin and I get to listen to them. Um, it's, a, it's a very cool job, and I come to these kind of things, and I see all the tools that we can use, uh, and uh, it's, it's overwhelming. And so the few tools that we use, I thought we'd just tell you about them, how we do them. Um, and then if you guys have any questions, just let me know. Let us know. Yep, my name is uh, Justin Rice. Uh, I, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, uh, graduated with a computer science degree from Penn State. Uh, I've been at Caterpillar for about five years. Uh, first couple of years I was working on uh, custom predictive analytics, uh, mostly in .NET. And then the last three years, uh, Mark and I have been working on Apache Storm code primarily. Um, just some fun facts about me. Uh, before I came to Caterpillar, I used to work on kind of some embedded devices and uh, synchronizing fireworks to music, which is a lot different than what I do now. Um, so like Mark said, uh, you want to go to the next slide? So like Mark said, um, we're going to give a little bit of a, a history uh, going back, dating back about 25 years um, of what Caterpillar does with telematics. And what I mean by that is uh, connected assets uh, in the field, um, where we started, and uh, the different generations uh, on-premise solutions to where we are now in the cloud. Um, so this is, this is Product Link. Uh, that, that's our trademark for really, at the end of the day, it's just a connected asset. Um, this is our um, trademark to dealers and customers for uh, the ability uh, for an asset in the field, like a, an excavator or a large mining truck, um, to communicate that data back um, to Caterpillar and then provide uh, insights into that data, whether it be fuel or location information. Can everybody hear me? So um, I'll just jump into a, a little bit of what I mean by, by the content of, of what we're, we're processing. So, so Mark mentioned there that we're listening to these machines every day. Um, Caterpillar has about a million uh, connected assets in the field, um, and they, they report many different pieces of information. Um, in 1995, which I'll get to in a second, was originally the, the birth of uh, telematics at Caterpillar. Um, and these were the main data types that would come off of those machines, uh, primarily location data, uh, service meter reading or hours information around those assets, um, fuel, um, some basic engine um, uh, information. Um, so this is an example message. We process primarily XML data. We do get some JSON data uh, on occasion. Um, the, the machine itself uh, reports in binary and there are some uh, parsers that go through and and process that data into an XML format when it gets back to us. Uh, these are the uh, four companies that we started with in 1995. Uh, two of them, I believe, are out of business, and we still work with Orbcom at the top. Orbcom uh, is a satellite company, and we only had uh, two satellites uh, when this all started. Uh, now there's a whole network up there. Uh, but we uh, would move uh, the data from our, uh, from our tractors uh, up to the satellite, and then we'd parse them. And uh, when it comes back, uh, the reason we use satellites is because a lot of our mines are not anywhere near a cell tower. A lot of them are in Australia and, and just in the weeds it, it's somewhere. Um, and so we had to have satellites, and so it was a little expensive at the beginning. Uh, this is our vision, and uh, it's still our vision today. Uh, we, we need to create a cost-effective data communication system that would transmit engine status warning and fault information over multiple wireless networks to Caterpillar dealers and customers. It was quite visionary that we actually did satellite and cell and everything at the very beginning. Uh, there are actually Wi-Fi and things like that now, too. Um, the first attempt was in 1996, and they actually had a tractor out in an open field, and it was going to transmit some information to us. And uh, they, were, they asked a vice president what uh, they wanted to transmit first, and he said transmit cash, the word cash. They had a five-limit display. 
you'd think it would be something like tractor or something, but it was cash. So we don't know what it is. So just to give you some preface here on what, what a, one of these devices looked like in 1996, this is what we called our Product Link 201 device. Uh, so it was just a metal box that uh, they slapped on top of one of these machines um, to start reporting this data. Uh, one of the interesting things about um, a lot of our equipment is it's in a lot of hazardous areas. Um, it gets beat up quite a bit. So if you were to just attach a normal uh, electronics device to a machine, it would probably get knocked off within a day. So these devices have to go through quite a lot of rigorous uh, testing to make sure that they'll hold up to the, the all the different environments that we that we go through. Um, so. Just some uh, background on, on the years that some of these were developed. We have uh, the PL101 was uh, one of the first devices that went production. I think we only sold about 100 of those units. Um, and then in 2000, we sold the PL201. Um, I think about 1,000 of those were sold. 2001, the PL101 was discontinued. And then on the right-hand side here, this is the PL321. So this was the first device that really um, hit the market uh, in stride. Uh, there's still about uh, 200,000 of these devices in the field today. Um, so getting into back into the back office type work, so there's really been th three uh, on-premise generations of uh, telematics message handling is what we call it. Um, so all of these devices that are reporting in the field, how do we bring all of that data back, collect it, and provide it to business customers Assets also get struck by lightning all the time. So our uh, uh, boxes have got to be able to withstand a lightning strike. Kind of cool. uh, this is some code. Uh, this, uh, this is some code. I, I just think it's cool. It's been running for 15 years. And uh, it's just some uh, uh, documentation. And hit the next button. Uh, it says this. Um, we have code that's been running forever, and it's running still well. Uh, Java 1.4 has been out of psych circulation for a long time, and yet we still uh, have this thing running. Uh, so G Generation 2 uh, came up, and uh, we, uh, I had a boss. Uh, well, anyway, here's, here's some new devices our engineers uh, finally decided to upgrade the devices. Uh, we got 25 new message types, and some of the message types are things like uh, DEF, uh, diesel exhaust fluid. Uh, we've got to do, uh, uh, each engine has got diesel exhaust fluid to keep for, em for emissions, and so uh, that's kind of exciting. So we've got like 25 different uh, new messages. It's not just fuel and, and location. Um, this is uh, a picture uh, here of what is actually on the tractor, and uh, I'm not even sure which one of those is an A5N2. That's the new network manager that we have. That's the one that's sprung into life, all this other stuff. Um, this is a sample, a message of the new one. Uh, we've got a header and then some data, and this is a fuel basic record. And so uh, this hex data here uh, is what's actually coming off of the asset, and then it's parsed into XML and then sent through our system. Uh, we've got a new, uh, we learned a new message uh, handler with the modern technology, and this was modern on-premise stuff, so we were still using, uh, we, we'll get that, well, Spring Hibernate Tomcat. Um, we had 25 new message types. Um, when I started doing this, I had just done corporate uh, systems. So, you know, just someone hits a button and then submits some data to the, the database and it comes back, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I didn't know anything about threading or MQs, or, uh, and I hated complexity. I'm still kind of a complexity nut. Uh, so I really fell into the best job ever. I got to just do whatever I wanted to. My boss uh, uh, let me. Uh, it was developed over uh, one year. Uh, and we just have four Tomcat servers running, and uh, we, we do about uh, uh, 200 messages per second with this system. Um, it's got 28 threads per Tomcat server, uh, 112 threads total. Oh, and this is a yeah, and since this, this particular generation was still on premise, we were a little bit limited in the technologies that we could use. But at the end of the day, we always went back to a SQL database just because of the simplicity. And, and really, at Caterpillar, it was uh, the most well-known 
thing, technology. So um, a lot of this uh, particular architecture was driven off of uh, a few different components here that Mark will get into. Yeah, so, uh, oh, there we go. So uh, it's, it's very simple, and, and believe it or not, this is our technology stack right here. We've got uh, an MQ in the back, we had four Tomcat servers, and then we had a SQL server. This SQL server, uh, we could just continue to throw stuff at it, and the beauty of it uh, was that it was so simple. When we started going to the cloud and we have uh, all these NoSQL databases and all the technology behind them, uh, we look back and say this was so pure and easy. Uh, we would just do a SQL call and save it to the database. Uh, and now the m knowledge we need for HBase and Phoenix and all this kind of stuff is just enormous. So um, it was quite, quite changing. Um, this is a technology stack here. Uh, we used uh, Java 1.6. Um, this is a, uh, a, a, an app that I wrote. Um, I wanted this thing to be roll out of the bed uh, supportable, so I could do everything uh, while uh, it, at one o'clock in the morning uh, that I could in bed, st sitting there with my phone, uh, that I could at work. So um, this thing, uh, I could restart servers with this. It would tell me what was down. Uh, this message handler is running fine. There was actually a little application that I wrote inside of it called the doctor that would diagnose problems, tell me what was going on, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was very sweet, and this is just jQuery mobile. Very simple. Um, we actually had a space here for a extra button, and so we made a Bitcoin server out of it too. And always got a couple of chuckles out of meetings, but I think there were some people who actually thought we were doing that. I don't know. Um, next, uh, one of the great things that we did uh, was unit testing. We um, our, our application was 80, 90 percent unit tested, and we did we could make changes very rapidly. Uh, we used JUnit and JMock. Um, and so we had very little downtime. Uh, it actually ran great, and we made it. Since I made it so simple, uh, it was a simple, simple way to run. Um, Swagger, uh, which I don't know if you don't know what that is, but it's a way to document a REST service. Um, it was very difficult at that time. It's not as difficult now, but uh, we just couldn't figure it out. So. I wrote uh, this little HTML form here, and you have to really be careful what you write because it lasted for a long time, and it's ugly as you can get. Um, that's actually Caterpillar yellow, though, I think, and then black. It's about the only good thing it has going for it. But when anybody asked us a question about any of our REST services, um, we would always answer it by updating this and then telling them to go look for it. So eventually, we had great documentation. So we, put, we would put data on an Oracle database, uh, we would write REST services on top of it, and then uh, our customers would use those REST services uh, using basic auth uh, to get the data. Um, this is the good out of the system. Uh, SQL database is very easy, Spring was very easy. I didn't use a dead letter queue uh, at all. A dead letter queue is when a message comes in and you can't process it for some information, then you throw it on a dead letter queue and maybe you'd reprocess it later. Uh, I went around about three groups and asked them, have you guys ever used your dead letter queue? Have you ever run anything off of it? And every one of them said, no, we never looked do it do anything with it. So we didn't even have one. If a message came in and it couldn't get processed, we just shut it off. Now, if a database was down, that was the only thing we had to sense. So we would uh, then reprocess it until the database came back up. Um, the struggles we had were uh, with Jersey. Um, our our uh, uh, contract people had a, a tough time using Jersey, and, and he hates it too. He doesn't like Jersey either. It's a, a REST service framework. Um, versioning was a struggle too. Um, there's really no good way to uh, version uh, uh, REST services. Uh, we had a functional testing team, and uh, while it was great to have a functional testing team, they wouldn't automate anything. Uh, so it was kind of a big struggle there. We would make a change, and then they would, it would take them two days to run all their scripts and everything. So that was difficult. Um, we, Hibernate is always hard. And then MQ was really uh, the nail in the coffin. Uh, Justin will get to that too. But uh, MQ is a great, great system, but when you're processing 500 messages a second, um, it's just too slow. And so essentially that was our on-prem solution and we had outgrown it and one of the reasons why we had to go to the cloud. Yeah, so, so shortly before um, we had moved to the cloud, the decision at Caterpillar hadn't quite been made yet. Um, but our, our leadership uh, this, during this time frame was really pushing for a consolidated platform. Um, there were a lot of data silos at Caterpillar uh, the, the Gen 1 product link data was sitting in one data warehouse, and then the Gen 2 stuff was sitting in another data warehouse. Um, so 
they really pushed for getting a platform that, that had all of, the, all of this data in one place. Um, so that's where Gen 3 comes along. So this, this really was about, uh, I would say, eight months before um, we got cloud approval at the enterprise level. Um, so um, really, really what this came down to was using the same technologies that we did in Gen 2, just expanding on the architecture a little bit. Um, one thing that we did was rather than coupling ourselves directly to a SQL database, so that was the only way to get data out, was more of a pub approach. Um, so we would, we would essentially bring this data into the system, harmonize the different generations, and, and publish it back out to other MQ topics, which is a popular strategy today. Um, and, then, and then an additional layer on top of that to save to um, a SQL database. Uh, so this is kind of an architecture, so it's just expanding on Gen 2. Um, what's kind of interesting about this is, we'll get to this in a few minutes when we get to our more of our cloud architecture, but um, we use Apache Storm today. Um, we didn't really know much about Apache Storm when we designed this, but looking back, um, it's kind of a, a similar uh, component level. Uh, we had a bunch of servers that were meant for parsing, so those uh, on the left-hand side could be considered like a bolt in Storm. Um, and then we had, we had MQs in between. So we would, we would process this data, um, turn it into different formats, whether it be XML or JSON. Uh, and even in this case, we were using Avro in, in, in certain approaches if the data sizes were, were larger. Um, and then we would push it uh, into this middle layer MQ, and, and that was essentially a, another layer of bolts in, in theory that would save data to a database. Um, Kind of the, the pros to this were we weren't coupled to SQL, so um, we did have another team that was uh, uh, building on-premise uh, Hadoop uh, workloads, um, and they wanted to leverage this data as well. So since we weren't, uh, the data wasn't just sitting in SQL, there was a, an MQ for them to pull from. Um, it made it a little bit easier on them. Um, independent scaling of the processing layer versus the persistence layer. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the MQ throughput, throughput, like Mark mentioned, uh, kind, of, kind of killed us. Um, and then the server management on-premise was a little bit more cumbersome than we wanted to deal with. Uh, this is just some uh, the technologies that we use. So like I said, uh, pretty similar to what we used in Gen 2. Um, this dashboard here is kind of just a... This is using code -hail met metrics to display some processing latencies and things like that for the different device types. Uh, so the push to the cloud. Uh, so like I said, Gen 3 was about um, eight months before we put the cloud. So we kind of had in our brain kind of some of the things that we wanted to do. Um, and, and really, we, we found that um, Apache Storm really fit our needs. Uh, it allowed us to um, scale pretty much indefinitely um, and be able to add uh, processing layers without adding additional servers um, like we did have to in, on, on premise. Yeah, so uh, we looked around uh, to look for a uh, technology that could get the anticipated throughput and we found Apache Storm. Um, our, our bosses uh, have told us that our goal was always two million assets. Uh, we're going to have two million connected assets, and um, so that's, we thought, well, we got to have something big. Um, this is the slide that I always wanted someone to show that never showed. Uh, in Apache Storm, you have bolts, uh, and I always wondered, well, how do other teams do the bolts? Do, do they have a ton of bolts? Do they have a, just a few bolts? Uh, Yahoo has one that has like 600 bolts in it, uh, a, a Storm topology. Um, ours has four, uh, three believe it, sometimes four. Um, so this is an event hub here, and uh, when uh, a message comes through, it goes through a spout, it goes to an init bolt, and then a parser bolt, and then eventually a persist bolt. Uh, a, a storm is essentially a pipeline, so you do little bits of, of uh, a processing here, 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 and finally you save it to a database. Um, so this has worked well for us. Uh, it, it's, it seems fast, and it scales pretty uh, easily. We do have trouble with uh, one topology um, uh, affecting another topology. So when one topology uh, gets overloaded with uh, a lot of data, uh, the others can actually slow down, and that's bad. Um, but it's been, it's been great. Um, oh, go back one. 
Yeah. Um, so up at the top there, we have 20 workers right now. We have 11 total topologies. Uh, we have 2,600 uh, messages that we've uh, pushed through one topology at a time. Uh, we usually have about 500 uh, at peak times of a caterpillar. It kind of goes up during the day and down at night. Um, our boss, when we finally hit 2,600, got us uh, 2,600 starbursts in a big uh, fish bowl thing, and we ate them for like two months. It was, took forever, but uh, it was kind of cool to see how many messages went through every second. Yeah, so th this is kind of a high-level architecture of, of how we're handling data in the cloud right now. Um, so we have a bunch of data streams on the left-hand side. We bring that data into Storm. Uh, Storm is kind of our harmonizer. So it, um, it, the left-hand side over here, those could be many different message formats. Um, so Storm is really responsible for making all of that data look alike. Um, and then uh, we use Redis really heavily. Um, we, these devices aren't always, um, they don't know what asset they're on. It, it, it's just a device that doesn't know what, what machine it's sitting on. Um, so a lot of that data we store in Redis, um, and then Storm can do lookups to see which um, asset a device is related to. Um, and then uh, we have this layer that kind of looks similar to Gen 3. We harmonize all of that data and, and push it back out to another data stream. Um, and then kind of the nice thing about this is this has kind of blown up on our side as the main um, entry point for anybody to get access to our data that needs to do stream analytics or things like that. So we probably have about five teams or so that um, ingest that data from that, that uh, middle layer there called TSF, which in our terms is just telematic standard format. Um, and at that point, um, any, any input data looks the same at, on the TSF layer. So if you're trying to do analytics on a device that's 30 years old, it doesn't look any different than analytics that would be done on a device that was built last year. Um, and then we also, our team uh, uses sto another storm layer um, after that point to actually store the data in a couple different data stores. Um, so we store all of our raw data, so individual message level data in um, HBase. Uh, we, we use Phoenix as our driver, so we uh, insert and query data with Phoenix. Um, and then um, we summarize some of that data um, with uh, web job technologies uh, written in C Sharp. Um, and we, we store that data in SQL, the summarization data. Um, and then really, which we haven't uh, talked about yet at all, is what's really the purpose of this. Um, so on the right side there is a picture of uh, dev.cat.com. So that's kind of our interface to the world um, or our business partners or customers or dealer network. Um, so that, that's really our RESTful API interface. So we land all of this data and then we're, we're really that's our entry point for the customer and dealer is those RESTful interfaces. Uh, so uh, you also notice that uh, we used to just do REST and that was our uh, uh, interface to the world. Uh, now we've got streaming capabilities uh, through Event Hubs. Um, and so that's th the next biggest change that we've done. So we're still kind of a little behind everybody, uh, uh, the high technology here uh, at the conference, but we're taking the step to the next the, the next level. Um, this is a topology strengths. Uh, we've actually added a, a new file type uh, in one day. So if someone, uh, some engineer somewhere dreams up some new uh, file to use, we can actually add it in one day, which is a very, very good. Um, it's relatively cheap, the uh, Storm topologies that we use. Storm uh, costs some, but you can add uh, servers to it uh, relatively cheaply. Um, our code is debugged. That's a good one, I guess. Um, it's flexible, it's easy to add bolts and, and such. Uh, we have great logging in our system too, so we know what's happening in it, uh, what, what, what's going on. Uh, the Storm UI is great, it runs uh, locally in, in our development uh, environment. Um, and, that, and that is huge. Um, we've, we've got some contract people that we've just brought on and it's been amazing how, how quickly they can get into Storm, get it running on their desktop and then actually start coding. Uh, Storm is, is, a, is a cloud technology. It's a, essentially a black box, it seems like sometimes. Uh, and yet they can still get into it and start coding right away. Um, so that's good. And then, of course, it's fast. Yeah, some of the challenges that we've uh, gone through along the way is uh, occasionally it can be a black box. Um, we've had some situations where we have many topologies running on one cluster. Um, 
and they impact each other, and it's a little bit difficult to determine which one is impacting uh, another one. Um, and the reason for that is if we have eight servers and we, we deploy storm code out to it, storm is managing all of that for us. So storm is deploying this set of code to this particular server, and maybe this other set of code may also um, reside on that server. So if you have um, one uh, storm topology that's doing a lot of data processing, um, and it's using 100% of the CPU on that server, it can potentially impact the other topology that is also running on that server. So it's things like that that aren't um, super obvious when you're looking at the Storm UI or anything like that to determine really um, how to fix the problem. Uh, documentation um, has been a little bit difficult in, in certain scenarios. Uh, we've gotten a lot of help from like Hortonworks on, on uh, trying to figure out or troubleshoot certain problems. It's that, it's that way for all the technologies it seems like you see here. When they talk about Spark and all those, a lot of the documentation is really difficult to find. Um, the other things that we've, we've run into, uh, kind of in, down into the weeds on some of these things, but um, adding uh, a small bit of code that you would sometimes think would be meaningless can have huge impacts. Uh, one of those would be uh, we were, uh, when you, when you um, send a message from one bolt to another and it has to uh, get serialized and sent across um, the network, uh, it, it Storm will behave uh, oddly if you um, change the object after it's already been serialized. So we were using a cloner, um, uh, an open source cloner, and uh, we had deployed this code out to production and uh, within a couple days we had found that for some reason, this new code that we had implemented was using 100% of CPU on all of the servers. And it took us a few weeks to find out that this cloner that we added was extremely CPU intensive. So when you were processing 500 messages a second, it was essentially just crushing our servers. Um, some of the other things, uh, event hubs, um, if anybody's familiar, uh, they're, they're really fast, but you also have to, uh, similar to Kafka, you, it's entirely up to the client to um, uh, be able to process that data. Um, and it, if, you don't, uh, if you don't know where you're at in the, when you're processing the data in the event hub, um, Storm essentially has to be able to know if it can act a message or not on the event hub. Um, and we got into a couple of situations where uh, we were recycling a message um, and didn't know it. Uh, and it kind of came back to haunt us where we thought we were at a certain point on the event hub, but we were actually uh, 12 hours behind on the event hub. So it was things like that have, that have been difficult. Yeah, so our uh, topology is essentially a mapper. Uh, we map it from uh, uh, XML to a DTO to uh, wherever it has to go to the database. Uh, so essentially we just map stuff all the time, and the tool we use for that is called Eureka. Um, it's just a, a, a fast mapper, and I just kind of wanted to show you this. It's It's been uh, good to us. Uh, we kind of made a little... Um, uh, uh, easy way to to uh, uh, work it up here, and that's this is one of the reasons that our contract people can uh, uh, join in so quickly is because we've kind of simplified the mapping uh, from one to another. Uh, so one other thing that we found um, within Storm is we originally tried to essentially uh, save each message in a single transaction, um, and as we got to uh, throughput of 500 plus messages per second, that was really the bottleneck was the, these individual transactions to the database. Um, so we had implemented a batching strategy, uh, kind of a micro batching strategy. So within Storm, there's this uh, concept of a tick tuple. So um, you can generate tuple every uh, five seconds or 10 seconds. And when that tick tuple occurs, you can um, uh, trigger something to happen. So the way that we implemented it is, we bring all of this data into Storm and we put it into what we call buckets. Um, and when those buckets get full or uh, some sort of max time period has expired, when the tick to pull um, triggers, it will look for those buckets that are full and it will dump all of that data to the database all at one time. Um, this, was a, this was a huge uh, performance uh, increase for us. Um, it drastically, I think we went from probably 
500 messages per second benchmark to be able to do 3,000 messages per second just with uh, adding the batching strategy. Um, and it, the nice thing about it is it's fully configurable. We can change settings on the fly to increase batch sizes. Uh, some databases like uh, HBase, uh, they handle large batch sizes much better than they do small batch sizes versus like an event hub for instance. Uh, smaller batch sizes may be better than large batch sizes in some cases. Uh, this is just some code first markdown. Once again, uh, when we change a database, we change the Java type and then uh, all of this is generated for us. Over there on the right is the Java type. Uh, we hit a J unit and all this documentation is all generated automatically. We even get a little bit of uh, SQL here to use um, to, to generate it. Uh, so just to touch on some persistence layers. So when we moved to the cloud, we were, we were very used to SQL. Um, so we tried a lot of things when we went to the cloud. We, tr we tried uh, table storage key value uh, technologies. We tried Mongo and DocumentDB, um, HBase and Phoenix. We even went back to SQL, um, and we even tried Hive a little bit here and there. Um, we've kind of this entire time have tried to go towards a PaaS approach um, uh, instead of an infrastructure uh, approach. Uh, so some that was kind of a primary reason why we tried these technologies over others. Um, at the end of the day, we did end up on HBase and Phoenix just because it was able to handle the ingestion rates, uh, and it had pr pretty decent query performance. Uh, some troubles that we have run into along the way with HBase, uh, most of these are our own fault, but uh, one thing with HBase is uh, it, since it's a distributed uh, uh, data store, um, it has to determine which data nodes the data gets saved to. Um, we had a situation where um, we had indexes on some of our tables that were based on a timestamp. And the way that HBase uh, works is it lexicographically scans the data before it saves it, and that's how it picks which data node it, it will save to. Since we were using a timestamp that was um, incrementing, uh, what would happen is we would have one data node at a time that was just getting hammered with all of this data. So in HBase that is considered hot spotting. Um, this was kind of a huge deal for us because uh, it took kind of required a production outage to go uh, rebuild all of these index tables. Um, HBase offers the ability to do uh, salting on a particular key uh, to, prevent, to make it more random so that, that hot spotting doesn't occur. Um, and when we first when we first moved to HBase, uh, after we had gotten a decent amount of data into it, it seemed that restarts uh, would take forever, and it would kind of block writes and uh, all sorts of things like that. So uh, we did have some issues with that when we first started. Um, we have a lot of teams that are using .NET, and when they interface with uh, HBase and Phoenix, uh, there wasn't a lot of documentation or tools to do that when we first started. It has gotten a little better since then. Um, and uh, we have had some uh, issues with select performance depending on um, how much data you're, you're trying to look at, like key ranges and things like that. Uh, I'm going to zip through these because we're almost out of time. Um, I guess the, the, the one that I uh, really want to talk about is the last one, and uh, I, I don't know if anybody here is actually doing any coding or anything, but we made probably every mistake you can possibly make with HBase. Um, we actually uh, called some of our uh, column names diesel exhaust fluid tank level, and when you call it, use a column name in HBase, it actually saves that every time you save a piece of data. Um, so our database was full of column names instead of data. Uh, so it was just uh, uh, kind of a big mess. Uh, the one, uh, go ahead, the one database that we really like, at least that I like, uh, is Redis. Uh, Redis is an in-memory database, essentially name value pair, and everything we've asked Redis to do, it is done, and it is just lightning fast. Uh, we uh, thought we we're trying to find some slowdowns in our system just last week. Um, we're getting point, uh, one to four millisecond writes, uh, reads and writes on this thing, so it's just incredibly fast. Um, we uh, have a little uh, GUI that we can uh, do some, some lookups on it. Uh, and this is kind of back to event hubs. So when 
on-premise, we were so used to MQ uh, technology that would show queue depths for certain clients. Uh, when we moved to the cloud and started using these event hubs for faster data process processing, uh, we, we found that um, there was really no way to tell within your client on how far back you were on message processing. Um, so we kind of had to invent that ourselves. Uh, so within Storm, when a message gets acknowledged um, at it, the end of its uh, life cycle, um, we were able to track kind of what the sequence number on the event hub was at the time of uh, where that was that we had just acknowledged. So between that and what the max sequence number was on the event hub, we can now determine um, if w the difference between those two is kind of how far off we are from uh, clearing the, that particular event hub. So this has been pretty useful. Uh, we just used, uh, we had to have some kind of dependency injection. So we tried Spring and Google Juice and uh, we f found Spring was a little tedious because of all the different ways Storm injects code into other JVMs. So we just, we settled on Juice and I don't like it that much, but. Uh, so I kind of touched on this earlier. Uh, so Storm is a fault tolerant uh, framework. Um, that can be great in 90% of the use cases, but in certain cases, uh, it kind of uh, came back to bite us in this one. Um, so the way that it works is if you don't acknowledge a message, it will just continue to replay it depending on how your spout is written. Um, in our case, what we had happen was a, a message was, we weren't able to process it. Um, an exception was getting thrown back to storm and that message was just recycling in an infinite loop over and over again. Um, what that really caused was um, we weren't really able to, to detect that this was happening because we were still processing other messages in the system um, until about two days later, the particular partition on the event hub that that message was on started to back up um, and our queue depth spiked all of a sudden and um, when we restarted the topology, we started back from that where that bad message was, which um, was about a 12 hour processing delay. I'll just go through this quickly. Um, so uh, one thing that we do as well is every message that we process, we also audit it. So um, we have the, the capability of searching any message that we process through the system for up to uh, 30 days. Uh, we store all of that data in HBase as well. Uh, so how does the cloud make our jobs easier? Uh, the biggest one probably is the first one, easily spin up a new te technology. We can uh, do that in our spare time, essentially. Uh, Friday afternoon, I always try to get everybody to do something that's not job related. Uh, and so you can spin up stuff simply, try it out, uh, all that kind of stuff, it's great. Uh, the connections database are trivial, proof of concepts are easy. Unfortunately, they oftentimes get into production, which is not good, but um, they have powerful hardware. Uh, CAT already has this. We, we have a really good uh, system, uh, hardware uh, in our, our data centers, um, but they aren't as easy to uh, configure. Um, access to command lines are cheap, uh, all this kind of stuff. And uh, I guess the last one is big too, uh, analytics. We uh, time everything now. Uh, I've written all so many applications that I have no idea what's slow and what's fast in them, and we can time everything due to all the analytics in the cloud. So that's a that's a fantastic thing. Uh, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, but uh, kind of to to wrap it up is what is all of this for? Um, so all of this data comes in, and and we we provide it back in RESTful APIs to dealers and customers and um, even engineering teams uh, to be able to process that data. This is our biggest application here, um, Vision Link, and it's just a GUI that a, a fleet uh, owner who's got 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 even uh, tractors can track all of his assets, uh, uh, puts a little push pin on a map, he can dig into it, he can find all the faults that have come in in the last two hours. Uh, you can find all the ones that need fuel. Um, this is the bread and butter of our whole system, and uh, our dealers love it. It's a, it's a good system. I think we already touched on this. Any questions?
Yeah. So our tractors um, have got uh, a, essentially a network on them. They got cables everywhere, and uh, they can click uh, stuff onto it. And so if they uh, add a dumper to the front, it's got an ECU in it that counts how many times it goes up and down. They just click it in, and then we will get a new message. Just things just like that. Transmissions send us stuff, the engine itself. Uh, it's pretty amazing. It's not Ethernet yet, but it's getting there. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, so that, that's where uh, obviously a REST API doesn't work for big data analytics. Um, so in the, in the uh, architecture diagram that I had displayed, that middle layer there, uh, we call it TSF, which is just a data stream. Essentially, it holds seven days of all of the data that has been processed. Um, most of our analytical teams consume from that data stream and pull that into other data warehouses or uh, technologies to do those data analytics. Uh, yeah, so we actually kind of did a bake-off originally. Um, we, we attempted to use um, Azure Web Jobs um, originally. Uh, it, the speed and processing and the ease of scale kind of made us choose uh, a Storm. Um, we did look into Spark a little bit originally. Um, I, I think the only reason we didn't choose Spark was just because the existing Gen 3 platform kind of looks similar to Storm, so we were kind of used to that kind of uh, architecture, and that's kind of the reason we went with it. It's also, it was also the guaranteed processing. We had to make sure that each message got processed at least once, and no other system could really do that for us. So all of our back-end systems are idempotent. So we can save it 50 times if we want to. It'll be the same, same thing. Uh, that is a great question. Um, well, uh, let me give you a use case that we use mainly. Um, when a message comes in, it's got a uh, serial number on it, but it's not the serial number of the asset, it's a serial number of the radio that sent it. So we have to match that to the asset. So we take that number and we go to Redis, and there's other systems at Caterpillar that keep updating our Redis cache. So we go in there and grab the data, we pull back a JSON object, then we make it, and that's how we get all the information out of it. Yes. Uh, we, believe it or not, we have a cache on top of, a memory cache on top of Redis. So we have essentially look in, in the memory first, then we go to Redis. Uh, I'm not sure if we even go anywhere else, do we, or do we? Sometimes I know we do, but in registration we don't, do we? Yeah. So sometimes... We'll go back to a REST API and then put it in Redis. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know, we were always told as IT guys, uh, don't uh, uh, share a database between systems. This is essentially the cheating way to share a database between systems. Um, but it has worked fantastic. We've never had it go down, never had any pro corruption issues with it. Uh, and it's very simple to use. Uh, we really, we really just use Phoenix as uh, making the queries easier for HBase. Um, w w most of Caterpillar is much more familiar with SQL, so the learning curve to learn uh, the underlying HBase framework and, and APIs. Uh, that's the 99% of the reason why we're using Phoenix. It's amazing. We have uh, one SQL call that we make in our message handler, and that's an in in an upsert essentially. Um, and so we've got like a SQL server and, and this uh, HBase, and we actually generate just the, an insert, a generic SQL insert, and it works for everything. It's kind of neat. We don't use Hibernate for it at all because we're not doing any, anything special.
Just simple. Oh, thanks. Good questions. Thanks, guys.